was Italy, 1943. Patton and Montgomery had won us a toehold on Europe. Moving up the Mediterranean, from Africa to Sicily and then across the mainland of the Italian boot, the Allied armies started moving north. Aircraft led the way, followed by tanks, followed by infantry. Rome was the first Axis capital the Allies were going to take, and the symbolism of its capture was nearly as important as its actuality. After all, if Hitler couldn't protect Mussolini, his oldest and most loyal ally, there didn't seem to be much Hitler could protect. Winter rains turned sunny Italy into a sea of mud. The 5th Army, moving behind a shield of bombers and fighters, took 61 days to travel 8 miles. Their order was to push north through the German lines and liberate Rome. Every day at 0600, the 12th Air Force reported for duty. Fighting the same winter weather as the boys on the ground, we got handed the grim job of blasting a hole through the German defenses. Italy, no soft underbelly, was defended by at least 24 tough German divisions. <laughs> we had 11. To balance the opposing forces, we had to control the air. There, there was no way around it. If the troops on the ground were going anywhere, they were going under the protection of our wings. Allied air power and Allied ground power had been welded into an effective team to defeat the enemy's greater forces. Our plan called for strong airstrikes to coordinate with steady ground pressure. Italian mainland is a narrow mountainous strip easy to defend, nearly impossible to conquer. The enemy had years in cooperation with a friendly regime to consolidate its resources. When they pulled back, the narrow roads and treacherous rail passages were easily destroyed. The advancing troops had essentially to build their own infrastructure as they moved. Allied forces, which now included some Italians, measured their advances in mountaintops instead of miles. San Pietro, like dozens of other German-held towns, was caught in a tight net of artillery fire. From village to village, from mountain to mountain, it was the same bitter action, attacks and advances. They approached Casino, the gateway to Rome. Casino was a beautiful town dominated by a hilltop abbey that had been built in the 6th century, the Abbey of Monte Casino. The Nazis installed an observation post in the abbey. They used it for forward observation and fortified it almost like a medieval castle to withstand a ground assault. It was the last bastion, the place where they would make their stand to hold the road to Rome. Relying on the reluctance of the Allies to damage the historic abbey, the Germans dominated the Leary Valley. From the sacred citadel itself, they directed concentrations of accurate and murderous artillery fire. Stalemated by the enemy's unique position, the road to Rome was blocked. After weeks of investigation, including personal reconnaissance over Monte Cassino by Generals Aker and DeVores, the Allies decided we would bomb and shell the Nazi-held town 
and Abbey. Aker was opposed to the bombing. Instead, he favored using an air blockade to cut off the enemy's supplies and starve the Nazis out. But, in the end, the brass decided that the continued sacrifice of our own men must stop. The 5th was ordered to continue north. Air power would have to make that possible. When the first wave of aircraft appeared overhead, the enemy darted into the caves and tunnels that had been carved into the solid rock below the abbey. job. We blew the hell out of that beautiful old abbey and the fifth moved north. But uh, I've got to admit, that was one mission I'd rather not have been on. One of the frustrating things was that even after destroying the abbey, the enemy was still strong. After all, strategically the abbey was nothing but a forward observation post. The mass of enemy troops still had the will to fight, and fell back to do exactly that. Up from their tunnels, their bunkers, up into the ruins, the tough Nazi troops quickly regrouped. The Germans were back in business. Now rubble, as well as Nazis, blocked the way. Air leaders finally convinced everyone that the only way we could crack the Gustav line was to choke off the enemy's flow of supplies south of Rome. The operation was aptly named Strangle. In March, those of us flying for the 12th and 15th Air Forces began to deliver a series of blows against railroad yards, tracks, trains, and bridges. <laughs> Especially bridges. In Italy, there were more than 40,000 bridges. Allowing the enemy no sanctuary, Operation Strangle was successful from the start. Fighter pilots hunted enemy trains and cut the Nazi supply lines in more than a hundred places. When the trains stopped, they hunted trucks and ships. If it moved, they went after it. They strangled the enemy's supplies, all right. On May 11th, the Allies opened a new air and ground drive, a big one. The Nazis were clearly on the run. Three days later, the Fifth Army cracked the Gustav Line, the historic southern line of defense around Rome. It had taken seven weeks for air power to cut the German main arteries and let them bleed to death. Mobility, the heart of German battle doctrine, was stymied. All his bridges were falling down. General Mark Clark said it this way, with the splendid effort of our air force, we put the enemy on the road. Right behind the fleeing Germans was, of course, the Fifth Army. We flew over Rome, but didn't need to bomb it. The Nazis were gone. There were tears from grateful Romans for the weary men who had exploded through the tight enemy ring at Anzio's bloody beachhead. Now, after nine months of brutal war, half of Italy was free, and the eternal city opened its arms. <laughs> who were we to refuse their hospitality? The Germans were desperate. 
By the time of the invasion of Normandy, they were deep into the development of a series of secret weapons that they honestly believed would salvage victory from what was so clearly becoming defeat. All they had to do was mass enough air power to protect those secret factories until they could start producing the so-called vengeance weapons on which they bet the future of Hitler's Reich. Nazi factories shifted virtually all production to the manufacture of aircraft. With painstaking German efficiency, they turned out fighters to stem the Allied tide. Planners in England watched in disbelief as the Luftwaffe grew stronger, even as Germany's territories shrank. By February, destruction of the mounting Nazi manufacturing base became urgent because their production was rising to the goal of a plane every 15 minutes. They'd never seen anything like them. Hitler's vengeance weapon, the V-1 buzz bombs, the Brits called them. Some of the fighter boys were taken off missions over Europe to try to intercept the jet-powered missiles before they got to England. The fast, pilotless craft with a devil himself to knock out of the sky. If you missed, which we usually did, you had to watch helplessly as they flew on toward London. On the heels of the buzz bombs came the V-2 rocket, a ballistic missile for which there was no defense. Tactics changed. The highest priority became knocking out the launch site. After the Normandy invasion, one of the great imperatives in advancing the front was pushing the missile launchers far enough back that London would be out of range. The missiles weren't accurate enough to have an effect militarily, but as a weapon of terror, they were devastating. A week after D-Day, half a million men and their weapons had landed in France, strengthening the beachhead by advancing up to 20 miles inland. Our aviation engineers had followed the assault waves in. As soon as we unloaded our equipment, work began on the landing strips. Some emergency runways were ready for operations in six hours. Around us, the Signal Corps boys strung up over a mile of wire every minute. Communications, reinforcements and supplies were building up for a powerful offensive designed to break out of the bulging Normandy pocket. We flew low levels in support of troops pushing south. We went hunting for buzz bombs. We kept jabbing towards San Lo and the rough hedgerow country. A stubborn struggle against strong enemy resistance. If you look at the progress made on the ground, there's a direct correlation to the weather. Northern Europe can sock in like almost no place else, and when the planes were grounded, the infantry went nowhere. The Germans used the weather repeatedly to delay Allied advances. At San Lo, one of the real stumbling blocks on the road to Berlin, there was no progress until a break in the weather allowed the Air Force to fly. The Battle of the Bulge was tied to a predicted long period of unflyable skies. Inevitably, however, the weather broke, and at San Lo and the Bulge, as soon as the fighters and bombers got back in the air, progress continued. <laughs> 
As General George Patton deployed his armored columns for a dash across France, air power was the only cover he needed on his right flank. He made a deal with the Air Force for close support and marched toward Berlin. Each fighter bomber acted as the eyes of an armored column and communicated by radio phone. Our job was to attack enemy concentrations ahead of our ground forces. By early September, the Allies were clear of the hedgerows. Protected and supplied by air, the mobile U.S. Third Army in one month was at the doorstep to Germany. For the first time in military history, an entire division quit fighting because of pressure from the air. Our 405th Fighter Bomber Group convinced German General Elster to surrender his division, consisting of 20,000 officers and men. Our 50 calibers hammered the Luftwaffe into oblivion. Our final air campaign swooped down in front of the ground troops. The Nazis, who had sought to dominate the world, were overwhelmed. The final capitulation came May 8th. Hitler was dead by his own hand. His entire general staff was dead or captive. Europe for the first time in a decade, was at peace. Asia, the other war. Fighting across cultures and almost unimaginable distances, the war in Asia was America's first real taste of World War II. The first thing that had to be done after the attack on Pearl Harbor was to stop the Japanese expansion. And that meant three things. Preventing the Japanese from gaining a toehold in Alaska, protecting Australia and New Zealand, and stopping the Japanese advances on the Asian continent. And the toughest was Asia. 
By the time we got into the war, the Japanese had control of China's ports. The overland routes meant running trucks over the Himalayas, which hadn't even been climbed at the time. The only hope of stopping the Japanese in Asia lay in resupplying the Chinese by air. We called it flying over the hump. When we arrived in India, we got our first idea of how much our sky wagons were slated to carry, and it was plenty. Food, medicine, gasoline, bombs. It would have taken hundreds of seagoing freighters to carry all of that, and all we had were airplanes. While still crated, the supplies moved by train due north about 800 miles. A ring of specially constructed air bases near the Tibet border served as staging areas. We started out with 10 borrowed transports and no loading equipment. Soon enough though, logistics caught up with us. We ended up with hundreds of high altitude transports. The flight was 500 miles and we flew it continuously through Japanese fighters and treacherous weather. We lost nearly 250 planes and crews flying over the hump, but we kept the Chinese stocked. For every Chinese bomber run against the Japanese, we had to fly a half dozen missions over the hump. We burned nearly a gallon of fuel for every gallon we delivered. A single transport could carry only a handful of bombs, but it was worth it. The Chinese fought on, and the Japanese, well, we didn't beat them in China, but we didn't lose to them either, and that's all we were trying to do. In the dismal and dreary Aleutian Islands off Alaska, it was a different sort of war. The 11th Air Force under General Bruce Butler had to protect Alaska from Japanese advance. The force was built around a few experienced pilots familiar with the harsh Alaskan conditions, holdovers from earlier test and training missions. That experience was the only advantage the Americans had. The Japanese had occupied a few small, almost uninhabited islands in the Aleutian chain. The key to the defense of Alaska was the retaking of those islands, a job largely to be accomplished by aircraft. On April 8th, the weather cleared and Americans set out for Atu, the most distant of the island chain. They also moved against Kiska, closer in toward the Alaskan mainland. We had 226 operational planes, and we were guarding the northern approach to America. I guess those islands were just more important to us than they were to the Japanese, because when the smoke cleared, we drove them back into the sea. The Japanese had come as far toward North America as they were going to come. To the south, the Japanese were threatening Australia. General Douglas MacArthur, humiliated in the Philippines, drew a line through the last few island bases still held by the Allies and announced that they would not fall. MacArthur aimed to seal the Japanese off to protect Australia and to set the stage for his return to the Philippines. The urgency of the situation led him to a daring experiment. He knew that in the Carolina maneuvers held years before the war, an entire working army had been transported successfully by air. He aimed to do the same thing to save New Guinea. And one day, we moved an entire Australian infantry battalion from their home base to the jungles of New Guinea. After a short one-hour flight, the troops arrived rested and ready. Along with the troops came equipment, two million pounds a week at the peak. The Japanese were stopped, Australia was safe, and our work had just begun. Despite the resupply, no one doubted that the Japanese would make a play for New Guinea. On December 27th, it came. Spotters reported large flights of Japanese aircraft headed for the island. The AAF dispatched a group of newly arrived P-38 Lightnings to break up the attack. 
at 10 minutes after noon, in a nearly cloudless sky high over the blue Pacific, the battle started. The enemy force included more than 28 Zeros and bombers. We got on top of them at 10,000 feet, and they showed their gratitude by coming up after us. One of the eager beavers in action that day was a, was a moon-faced lieutenant by the name of Richard Frost. He got the first kill. Tommy Lynch got two more, making him the squadron's first ace. When the score was finally added up, our lightnings had shot down 11 enemy fighters and bombers. We didn't realize it at the time, but the Japanese wave on the Pacific had crested. As soon as New Guinea was secure, MacArthur ordered the engineers to start building air bases. And those air bases were to be used for offensive, not defensive operations. While the people back home were still wondering whether the Japanese could be stopped, MacArthur was convinced they already had been. He was getting ready to move against Japan. MacArthur's plan was an easy one. Rather than attempting to take every one of the thousands of islands scattered around the South Pacific, he would concentrate on a few key islands. Those islands either had or could have air bases and could be used to strangle Japanese resupply efforts. Perhaps more than any other American general at the time, MacArthur understood the importance of integrating the efforts of the Army, Navy, and Air Forces. Island hopping depended on it. First, he would order air strikes against an island. Navy and AAF planes would then bomb relentlessly. The Navy's battle groups inhibited any attempts to reinforce the Japanese troops under attack. And when the time came, the Navy and AAF would transport the ground troops to the island. Not far behind those troops came engineers who built and repaired air bases on the captured islands so that they could be used as jumping off points for the next assault. August 1943 at the Quebec Conference, Army Air Force General Hap Arnold proposed to pierce the Japanese homeland with B-29s from bases on Tinian, Saipan, and the Chinese mainland. The Japanese industrial base was largely untouched. It was protected from bombers by the long distances between islands. An Allied victory, Arnold knew, depended on the AAF's ability to damage the factories and ports that were keeping the Japanese military supplied. Arnold's plan was audacious. His strategy was dependent on the B-29, an as yet unbuilt bomber, operating out of bases that were at the time still in Japanese hands. Roosevelt promised the Allies 200 B-29 superfortresses by March 1944. The Allies agreed to shift their strategy, attacking forward air bases within range of Tokyo rather than more conventional targets. Roosevelt had seven months. We felt the pressure immediately in the factories. A few of us had been plane builders in World War I, but we had never been through the kind of push we were starting now. In each B-29, there are more than 55,000 numbered parts, miles of wiring, a million rivets. Across the country, in Kansas, and Nebraska, and Washington State, miracles of modern machinery became everyday events. By December, only four months after the President's promise, we'd put together 35 superforts in our one factory. And by the end of January, there were 142 superforts flying with more coming off the line every single day. <laughs> 
On the other side of the world, a different kind of miracle was unfolding. Allied troops were advancing on all fronts, and behind them was being built an infrastructure of bases that would eventually bristle with superforts. In China, where labor was cheap and machinery all but impossible to find, armies of laborers built a network of air bases almost by hand. They were using the same primitive methods their ancestors had used thousands of years before to build the Great Wall. Under the direction of 26 American officers and enlisted men, the Chinese rolled out four great air bases. On April 24th, the superforts arrived in China. They had hopped the Atlantic, Africa, and India, from Kansas to China, in a week. It didn't seem possible, but only a year and a half after the first experimental B-29 was flown, a fleet of American aerial dreadnoughts were arriving at the front. Within 10 days, our total strength was 130 superforts. With more on the way, the runway builders never stopped. Like the Germans, the Japanese believed their empire invulnerable. Since Pearl Harbor, steel capacity had doubled. They rolled that steel into ships, hulls, and aircraft, into bombs and bullets. While suffering enormous losses at the hands of Allied submarines and aircraft, Japan maintained the world's third largest merchant fleet by continuously launching more and more ships. The Joint Chiefs of Staff ordered a maximum effort. The target was Iwata, Japan's heavily guarded Pittsburgh, which produced one-fifth of all Japan's steel. We sent 68 superforts against Iwata. We followed the lead ship, Lady Hamilton, and we followed the Marines landing on Saipan that morning. We headed out high over the Yangtze River and across the Yellow Sea. When we got to Japan, the Japanese were ready. They sent up everything they could. Two and a half years after Pearl Harbor, the superforts struck back. The long process of dismantling the Japanese industrial infrastructure had begun. Land-based planes dropped bombs through clouds on Iwata. A global bomber and a global air force were in operation. The beginning of the end of the Japanese Empire was underscored in exploding bombs. MacArthur was on the verge of taking the Philippines. Feeling that there were too many enemy strongholds behind and around his rapidly advancing island hoppers, he ordered land-based bombers to pound sea lanes and troop centers. As the superforts pounded the Japanese mainland, the B-24s and 25s pounded the periphery of the Philippines. As far as the Japanese were concerned, the Philippines were the war. Clearly, if they lost the Philippines, the largest of the Pacific Island groups, there would be no saving the empire. When the Allies landed on Leyte, the first of the Philippines, the Japanese threw everything they had into its defense. devastating, but most devastating of all was Japan's secret weapon, the kamikaze. That was something for a pilot to see. Aircraft stuffed with explosives, deliberately crashing into enemy vessels and bases. We started dogfighting the kamikaze, trying to stop them before they could get within range of our fleets. They didn't fight much. They just, they just flew right through your fire. They were so focused on their targets. We got some of them, and some of them got through. Killed a lot of good men and boys, but never came close to turning us back. It was a hell of a thing for a pilot to see, though. The pattern continued across the Pacific. Air assaults, naval blockades, and finally, amphibious attacks. Island after island, building toward the inevitable, incredibly costly invasion of the Japanese mainland.
At no point did the Japanese show any inclination to surrender. On island after island, troops that have been isolated for weeks refused to come out of their caves. Even when threatened with incineration by flamethrower, left alone they appeared as snipers, so they were burned. Civilians jumped to their death off hundred-foot cliffs rather than be taken prisoner. The emperor, who was believed divine by the Japanese, repeatedly appealed to his soldiers to fight to the death. That the very essence of Japanese culture was at stake. We knew we'd have to invade. By the end of 1944, we were even talking about it, wondering where it would be, whether the main assault would come from the south or from the west, what our own role would be in it. All anyone knew for sure was that MacArthur had us taking islands that would be key to the invasion, and that facing an island of 50 million fanatics willing to die for their emperor or god was not going to be pretty. Back in the states, a small army of physicists and engineers was developing the first atomic bomb. The Manhattan Project was a race against time. The war in Europe was over. And the war in the Pacific was not waiting for the results of their research. If they were going to be a factor in the war, they were going to have to work fast. There's been a lot of talk about the morality of dropping the atom bomb on Japan. When President Truman made the decision to go ahead with the drop, his overwhelming concern was for Allied troops. They were men and boys who hadn't wanted to fight anyone, but who had fought valiantly. The Manhattan Project brought him the ability to put an instant end to the war. Whatever your point of view may be in hindsight, it's easy to see why Truman made the decision he made. The world was tired of war; it needed to be over. The crew had been training for months without really knowing what they were training for. Some kind of super bomb, the rumor mill said. The crew called it the gimmick. The final field orders were cut by General Sweeney, and the crew of the Enola Gay watched the weapon squad load the biggest bomb any of them had ever seen into the belly of the plane. They mounted up and took off on one more mission, like every other mission, except, except they were alone in the sky, flying without other bombers or fighter cover. Hiroshima was a port city. Relatively untouched by the war, on the morning of August 6, 1945, a single bomb exploded a hundred feet above the Civic Center. In a few seconds, as the Enola Gay banked off toward home. Fifty thousand people died, and the world changed. Three days later, a second bomb fell on Nagasaki. The Japanese surrendered. World War II, which had taken more than fifty million lives worldwide, was over. August 14, 1945, VJ Day. The Second World War was over. The world, after more than a decade of war, was at peace. With the surrender of Japan came joyous relief. The anxieties and grief and horror of universal war were suddenly gone. Lives interrupted, resumed. Transport vessels, loaded with returning troops, poured into stateside ports even faster than they'd poured out when the war began. All most of the troops ever wanted was to go home, and winning the war was the ticket to get there. <laughs> 
It was not only a time of great rejoicing, but a time of great optimism as well. Evil had been defeated, and good had triumphed. The ultimate expression of that optimism was the establishment of the United Nations. When the delegates assembled in San Francisco to sign the charter, huge crowds gathered outside. After two great world wars, they wanted to witness the achievement of everlasting peace. But if you just look at the nations that signed, you'll see how that promise was betrayed from the start. For example, nationalist China was a member, but the vastly more populous communist China wasn't. The signature of France symbolized Europe's longing to escape further war. The presence of the Soviet Union's delegate seemed to justify that hope. The United States, Great Britain, nation after nation, signed pledging to respect national boundaries and settle their disagreements without resorting to military means. The Army, which then included our Air Forces, was soon down to 20% of its wartime strength. Thousands of aircraft were mothballed. Thousands of others were either sold or broken up for scrap. From a powerful wartime force of two million men, our air personnel dropped to about one-seventh of that strength. That made a few people kind of nervous, including Hap Arnold. As commanding general of the Army Air Forces, it was his job to worry, and he did. We must be sure that none of these victories is wasted and thrown away in the years to come. There will no longer be any spot on Earth, and certainly not in America, that is safe from attack by air. For our protection, we must have an Air Force second to none. For this, we need a great aviation industry, a great air transport system, and a great body of trained personnel. But we'll need more than planes and pilots and mechanics. We'll need scientists and mathematicians. And we'll need the full inventive genius of the American people. With these, we can protect the future, ourselves and our allies, with the weapons of the future. The few voices that protested the dismantling of the American military machine went almost unheard. The world was rebuilding for peace. Europe, which had been devastated, was under construction from one end to the other. The Marshall Plan went into effect in Japan, and the Allies went to work repairing the very same vital industries they had worked so hard to destroy during the war. Clearly, the world had learned a few lessons. Hitler rose in Germany largely because of the punitive measures taken after World War I. This time, there were no punitive measures taken. No war reparations demanded of either Germany or Japan. And although the nation as a whole seemed to understand the necessity of strength in preserving peace, it took little action. Budget allocations for defense-related research shrank. It was nearly impossible for Hap Arnold to carry out his program of modernization and growth. The development of jet aircraft was a most urgent requirement, and that was proven when a P-80, one of the early jet fighters, made a spectacular flight from Long Beach, California to New York City. In four hours and 13 minutes, that P-80 crossed the continent. And that should have shown everyone that the rules and assumptions about what was militarily possible were changing. But it takes money and time to bring new aircraft from the drawing board to operational use. And that change was made more gradual because the defense budgets were kept so low. 
jet fighters were coming into operation, jet bombers were still in the developmental stage. But even the new generation of propeller-driven bombers proved a few points about the changed nature of the world. We prove the possibility of a global air force with strategic capability in a B-29 left over from the war. One day in October 1946, we towed her out at Hickam Field, Honolulu, for what must have looked like a normal training mission. There were nine of us in the crew, and we'd waited 34 days, partly because of weather conditions, partly because of mechanical difficulties. Everything had to be right. We were going to try to make one of the greatest flights in air history, non-stop from Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific, over the North Pole, to Egypt. That was 10,000 air miles without refueling. We had a fuel load of more than 12,000 gallons, the heaviest ever carried by a superfort. It took us a run of 8,000 feet to get us off the ground, but the takeoff was perfect. The route took the B-29 up across the coast of Alaska and then over the North Magnetic Pole. The plane had no de-icing equipment and the crew was racing in Arctic storms sweeping in from Siberia. The B-29 passed over Greenland, Iceland, the United Kingdom, France and Italy, then out over the Blue Mediterranean. Everybody was pretty tired by then. We'd been in the air for 39 hours. It was Sunday morning in Egypt when we came in for our approach. We left Friday morning, flying 9,500 miles nonstop. We'd crossed two continents and landed on a third. We'd shrunk the world by half. By going over the pole like that, the Army Air Force was proving that no point on the globe was safe from the kind of surprise attack the United States had experienced at Pearl Harbor. It meant that any point on the globe was accessible from any other in a matter of hours. And that would be a wonderful thing for transcontinental travelers, but it was a nightmare for defense planners. Despite the shrinking post-war budgets, there was an understanding that progress needed to be made in air defense. In 1947, the War Department and Congress agreed to a monumental bureaucratic reshuffling designed to make the AAF a more powerful voice on defense issues. The Air Force, previously a part of the Army, spun off as a separate entity. It was hoped at the time that this would end the internal rivalry. That rivalry usually worked to the Air Force's detriment since few of the top brass had any first-hand experience with air war. Now, believing that the Army and Air Force separated would get along better than they had together was probably as naive as believing the United Nations could end war. But those were optimistic times. Billy Mitchell had proposed a split years before, and us flyers were all for it. We were tired of answering to brass who had never flown and who had more belief in tanks than in aircraft. There were more than 300,000 of us in the Air Force, and now we had a uniform of our own. W. Stuart Symington became the first secretary of the Department of the Air Force. General Carl Spotts, veteran of both world wars, became the first chief of staff of the United States Air Force. The newly independent United States Air Force put a heavy emphasis on research into advanced aircraft. 
1947, at what was then Yurok Desert Test Center in California, a small team of pilots and engineers gathered to make history. Their goal, to break the sound barrier. The transcontinental flights, the trips over the pole and across the oceans, were all about distance. The X-1 program at Muroc, which is now called Edwards Air Force Base, was all about speed. The forces and vibrations that built up in the transonic zone were so great that they'd torn apart all aircraft that had ventured close to Mach 1. Because of that, there were people who believed that the sound barrier couldn't be broken. The pilots and engineers of Muroc set out to break it anyway. B-29s have done a lot of memorable things, <laughs> but none of them ever had a mission quite like this one. The plan was for an old B-29 to take the test aircraft, the X-1, aloft. At an altitude of about 35,000 feet, the B-29 would cut the X-1 loose, and it would fly up into the thin atmosphere, where there was little wind resistance. The X-1 wasn't really a military aircraft. It had no guns or bomb-carrying capability. Its weight empty was less than 5,000 pounds. It was pure research laboratory designed to test the effects of supersonic flight on aircraft. Fully loaded, it could carry one pilot, a skinny captain from Oklahoma named Chuck Yeager, and 8,000 pounds of fuel. It was powered by four rocket engines. The X-1 carried enough fuel to power the plane for only two minutes. That was enough, according to the engineers, to boost the plane supersonic. After that, Jaeger and the plane would glide back to the ground. Everything we did out at Muroc in those days was secret at least from the outside world. But when Captain Yeager suited up that day, we all knew what he was about to try. The radar crews were ready to do the tracking, calculating from his flight path how fast he was traveling. The other pilots knew. The ground crew knew. The few wives and girlfriends living on the base knew. When the B-29 took off, for the sake of secrecy, we acted as if it were just another day. But all eyes were on the sky. Captain Yeager had banged himself up riding horses the day before he was scheduled to revolutionize the world of flight. He'd wrenched his shoulder so badly he could barely move. The only thing having to do with the flight he couldn't do was close the hatch on the X-1. Rather than give up the chance to be the first man to go supersonic and live, he jerry-rigged a sawed-off broomstick as a lever. He had to sneak it down the narrow passage into the plane, but it worked well enough. The first supersonic flight would not be delayed by an ornery horse. Jaeger flew the mission as checklisted. As he approached the sound barrier, he kept a firm hand on the stick and an eye on his Mach meter. The faster he went, the more the plane buffeted. But as he approached the speed of sound, the plane seemed to calm, and it passed through the speed of sound almost without notice. We heard the sonic boom 
We knew what that boom meant. For the first time, except in dives, a man had flown an airplane faster than the speed of sound. <laughs> it earned Captain Yeager many honors and historic acclaim. The X-1 got a resting place in the Smithsonian Institute.